Prosper. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm.
for life. We thank you for Fill breath. Us with your love. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Fill us, Lord. How many are alive this morning? Amen. You have something to thank God for. Father, we look to you. We welcome the Holy Spirit right now to come and teach us, encourage us, lead us, guide us, reveal your truth to us, Set us free from the strongholds inside of us that we don't want there so that we can be who we want to be, children of a living God, yes. children of love and children of blessing, yes. children who know our Father God, children who love God and children who love one another. So we ask you to come today as we gather together in your name, honoring the word of God, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And we look to you for your goodness, for your blessing, and for your love. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, the, the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. And if, if anything we learned during this pause, it was the necessity to fellowship together with the body of Christ. I heard so many people say I had to repent because I, I had not valued being in the church family. I didn't value being able to come. I didn't value being able to come and worship together. Now that we can't, I'm realizing that I really do need that. A couple of testimonies. Um, yesterday, um, there were several hundred of us that volunteered for the June 27th miracle for um, sorting the food. And, and before I say this, I just want to, let's have all of the kids stand up. You guys are awesome. You guys have been doing so, go ahead, go ahead and stand up. You guys are awesome. You've been doing so good in the services. I know it's really challenging for you. Come on, let's give them a good hand. We love our kids. And, okay, you guys can go ahead and be seated. If you don't know, we do have some, like, packets over there. And um, even if you just wanted one for the stickers, I would totally understand that. Uh, but our kids have been doing such a great job. And it's really difficult on them because they're used to being able to have classes in the back. And because of guidelines right now, we can't have that. So I want to thank you guys for how you have come and participated and listened to the word of God. And you have done a really good. And you know what? God is going to bless you for that. Amen. God's going to bless you for it. Yes. It, everyone here is a family with children. And so we're all going to give each other grace. Now, if your kid starts running like a crazy animal, you know, contain that. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to. <laughs> yeah, a little noise isn't going to bother us. You know, I don't want to do, 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 do. Don't do that. But um, there were hundreds of people yesterday that came together, uh, I think in the entire county, there were 11,000 volunteers that signed up to help. And what, I, I talked to Christine a lot, because if you didn't know, Christine and Vita, who visits with us on, on Sunday nights, they are overseeing the sorting section of this. And um, they also get to be over how that gets distributed. So the, the idea of this is not just to go around and fill up food banks so that they're full for the next five years. The idea of this is to help the community. So even though the entire county was doing this, every single town had their own 
collection place. And so what came in for Leamington is going to help Leamington families first. And after we have exhausted everybody who needed it and all the food banks and all the churches that provide meals and any organization, the bridge, all these different ones that do those things, if there's anything extra, then we're going to give it to neighboring communities that need it. But, I mean, I don't know if you saw some of the pictures that I posted. It was a lot. And there's, the work isn't done. So if you were like, man, I didn't even know that I could volunteer for that, you can still volunteer. They're going to be there at least all of this week and possibly into next week as well, and probably will need all of that time. Um, every day, Monday through, I think Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., with the exception of Canada Day, they will be there at the arena. And if you didn't already sign up, you can just contact Christine, and she'll get you signed up. And you can just show up, and if you can only volunteer an hour, that's great. They are asking for four-hour increments. Um, please dress, like, for heat stroke. Because <laughs> it was extremely hot in there the other day. I'm, I'm working on a plan to get somebody to get that air conditioning turned on for them. Um, but they're going to need help all this week. So it's, and it, did you see the pictures of those big, huge wooden crates? So those crates have to be taken out and sorted through into different items, and then those items have to go over to the packing section, and then we sort through them by expiry dates, taking out anything that's rusted, anything that's broken, anything that doesn't look like anybody would want to eat it, that doesn't get used. And then things that are going to expire immediately are put into a separate pile, and then things that are over the next year, and then things that are beyond that, so that they know exactly what they have, and... Christine shared this morning um, that not only is this for organizations, but they want to give help to families directly. And there's a lot of families who don't, wouldn't think to go to a food bank because they're not, you know, they're not, not, they don't have nothing. So they don't think I need to go to a food bank, but maybe they could use a little something just to encourage them. So Christine and Vita are taking, um, uh, an account of families that we know. So if you know a family that could be benefited by receiving a nice big box that has like a week or so of unperishable foods in it, um, you can email that to the church. All we need to know is the name of the family, their address, and how many people are in there. We don't need to know their income. We don't need to know all these details. We don't need to know if they visited any other food bank. That's all we need to know. And then I will get that list just because I know Christine and Vita have tons of text messages and emails right now. Yeah, yeah, if they have pets, because we've had donations of pet food. So even if someone, one of those families has pets, you let us know those details, and they will make a, a box for that family. So, you know, let's take advantage of this, because there's a lot. So if you know someone who could use some help, give us their name, because it would just be a blessing, and we might as well bless people while we have the opportunity. The other thing I wanted to just share with you s just quickly is, you know, our, if you've been coming on Tuesday nights, you've kind of heard this. Um, our finances here at the church have unexpectedly just really been blessed. Like, I, I don't even know if the word blessed is, I mean, probably in the real definition of it, because God said blessed, you know. But it's like, it's like beyond blessed. It's super blessed. It's exceedingly abundantly above and we have sewed out over $6,000 since March 15th as a church family into families in our church, families in our community, local pastors around here in the area that needed a little extra, either help with groceries or help with bills, uh, to our OPP, to the fire services, to the ER doctors, to the nursing homes that are around. Um, we have also sown overseas to other pastors and other nations where they don't even have food right now. So that's $6,000. Then over and above that, we've spent four to five in equipment to be able to have our services online. So that's like at least 11000 and all that's paid for, at least $11,000. And then after that was all done, and our normal bills are paid, and all of the normal, um, uh, not expenses, um, not obligations, our, our normal giving that we normally sew out, none of that's fallen off. And so after all that's paid for, 
our checkbook balance has increased over $13,000. And I have heard so many testimonies. I, now, how many, there, there are several, how many in this last season of time, you know, since January 1st till now, have paid off a credit card? There's like six families. How many of you have received a pay increase? How many have received a new job? How many have got an unexpected check in the mail? Unexpected financial blessings? I have, like, been blown out of my mind for myself. I have received, and, like, this does, you guys have heard me before, you know, the, the $600 in the journal was crazy because I was like, I never get checks in the mail. I've received five unexpected checks in the mail. Like, like had to go to a mailbox and open it up, and they were, it was there. Because I never get my mail, so I've been getting my mail regularly. <laughs> Five, which doesn't account for other financial blessings, like that I got a new washer and dryer because I also have construction in my house doing my basement, and I unexpectedly got $200 refunded off the washer and dryer. That wasn't a check, it just went to my bank account. And I also got a new mattress, and someone unexpectedly paid for half of my mattress. These are just, I mean, like, I think when I totaled it up, I think I've been blessed personally with, like, five grand. I'm like, Lord, what's going on? It's, it's awesome. I've been, I still have my tax return because I'm like, Lord, what do I spend this on? Because this isn't mine. This is yours. How do I, what do I do with this? I want to steward this right. You're blessing me, and I want to continue the blessing. So I'm just really encouraged because when I see multiple ones of us, I think the one Tuesday night prayer that we did on Zoom, 17 people had testimonies of either uh, new car, new job, pay increase, promotion, unexpected blessing, something like that. Credit card paid off, credit paid off, debt paid off. And um, you know what that says to me? That says to me that we're reading our Bible and that we're thinking about our Bible, and that we're doing the things that we see listed in the Word of God, because when we do those things, that we're blessed. And it really has nothing, and if, if, if anything else doesn't prove this to you, this should. It has nothing to do with what's going on in the economy. And there have been other ones who have had testimonies where God has just miraculously provided their needs because they were either out of work or, you know, had less hours, and God has just provided Everything he does is good. I mean, like, I seriously, I, I can't, I'm like, that's how it is. When I start to think about what God's done, I, I can't even, like, you know, process it. And the Lord had to rebuke me because I'm like, God, this is amazing. He's like, what have you been saying to the people for, like, the last year and a half every time you receive the offering? He goes, you keep on declaring blessings over them and promotions and new jobs. He goes, why are you, like, blown away that I actually did it? <laughs> I was like, Lord, help my expectation be right. Help my expectation be right, because your word is true. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's turn on our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. You get a little embarrassed when you're like, God, this is amazing. He's like, well, seriously, didn't you ask me for that? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> this morning I want to talk about the weapons of our warfare. Let's just pray before we get into the word. Father, we just thank you for the word that you have given us because your word is life. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just anoint these words to go and produce fruit in the life of our church family. Even as you have been doing, Lord, we just ask for you to continue to bless us, to increase us, to prosper us, and even to bless us in our understanding of your word. We give you praise this morning, and everybody said, amen. 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 So I want to read Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 10 through 19, and then we're going to talk about it. So it says, 
Um, I'm in the King James, Danny. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, where you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And, uh, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 11 said this, put on the whole armor. Put on all of the armor. Now, different ones have shared this in different ways. And... Uh, though we may do certain things in order to help us understand, this isn't talking about having a time each morning before you set your feet to the ground and get out of bed to make sure that you put on a belt and put on a breastplate and go through physical motions of pretending to put things on. Now listen, if you do that, just be blessed to do whatever you feel that you need to do with the Lord. Be blessed to be led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the Lord asks us to do some strange things in order to prove and to get a point across to us. But it's not just talking about having an imaginary time of putting something on. When, when I was reading this last night, it was really talking to me and speaking to me of grab hold of everything God has provided for you. You're going to like, you know, the Bible talks about clothing ourselves with something. Well, that means it's making it personal. It's bringing it close to ourself. It's grabbing a hold of it and not letting it go. Because when you look through the list of these things that it says are the armor, it is everything that God has provided for us. It's the foundation of who we are as Christians. So God wants us not just to have these in a closet somewhere in our home, that we possess them, but he wants us to have them on us. He wants them to be used. These are not things that we just put into a closet for a, a rainy day. This is something that we have on it. We make it part of our identity. To clothe ourselves, to cover ourselves, that when people see us, they see what God has done for us. They see the provision that he has given to us. And that... You know, clothing, a lot of times, is, is part of our identification. When you're working, there are certain clothing that is used for certain jobs. And when you see someone in certain clothing or a uniform, it helps you to be able to identify them. This is part of our identification as a Christian. Verse 10 says, it says, To be strong in the Lord, which I've preached on before, and the power of his might. And what I really believe that saying is, if you want to be strong in the Lord, this is how you do it. Clothing yourself in what God has provided, grabbing hold of what he has provided for us, is what makes us strong in him. So be strong so that when you apply the word of God and you walk in his principles, then you're strong. We just went through sharing testimony from our church family for the last four months of being strong financially because we applied the word of God to our situation, regardless of what was going on around us, and God blessed us. So we are able to stand strong even though there are challenges abounding around us. Financially, we're strong because we've applied the word. In the same way for every area of our life, 
regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of the disappointments that we've walked through or the challenges or the spiritual attacks we may feel, God wants us to be able to stand strong by grabbing a hold of what he has provided for us in his word, clothing ourselves with us, using it, and as we do, we are able to stand. Verse 11, to stand strong, to stand firm when the enemy attacks. A lot of times people think, and, and I think it's been preached wrongly, I don't, I don't think we've ever really preached this, that when you get saved, all your problems go away. That's like a really big joke. <laughs> Sometimes when you get saved, more problems come your way. That's just the truth. That's not speaking doubt and unbelief and negative. That's just honestly some truth. Because Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. I mean, this literally says, hold on, have to adjust the eyes. Um, this literally says to put on the whole armor so that you can stand against the attack of the enemy. So in other words, the enemy is going to attack you. I'm telling you in advance, spoiler alert, you will be attacked, and you're going to be attacked by the enemy. That's who's going to attack you. God's not attacking you. Your neighbor is not attacking you. It may feel like your neighbor is attacking you. Your neighbor is not attacking you. The enemy is the one who is the attacker. And it's kind of really important for us to have a clear understanding of who the real enemy is. Otherwise, we make enemies out of people, and people are not our enemy. But you're going to have an attack. And here's who it's coming from, the devil. So now I want you to be prepared so that when that attack comes, that you don't get knocked down. That you don't get blindsided. That you don't get, like, run over and flattened. That you're able to stand. It might not feel like you're strong, but you are. And when you clothe yourself with the word of God, you are able to stand, and it says against all the schemes, all the strategies, all the tactics. You know, a lot of times, we give the devil way too much credit. Now listen, he is a deceiver, and he is the father of lies. But he is not a creator. That's God. He did not create demons. There was a revolt against God in heaven. And when Satan fell, he took, it says, a third. Angels are not like us. They don't reproduce. They were not given the command to be fruitful and multiply. That was to us. So the amount of angels that God created at the beginning is the same amount of angels that are here now. One third went with the enemy. So yes, there is a, a, a demonic force. There is a demonic army. But there are two angels for every one demon. So if you are afraid of demons all the time, then you need to get a revelation that there are more for us than there are against us. Not only that, but it's the same dudes. It's the same ones. There's not like new demons coming out. There's not like baby demons someplace in a hatchery or something like that. I mean, you guys watch all kind of weird movies. I've seen some of those things, man. It, there aren't new demons. It's the same ones. And the word tells us, this is, this is kind of interesting, write down these two scriptures, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, and 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. 2 Corinthians 2 says, you are not ignorant of the devil's devices. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says this, these things happen to them, talking about the ones who are in the Old Testament, these things happen to them as examples, and they were written down for our instruction now. So the things that, were, that happened in the Old Testament, they are not stories, they are our accounts. They are history. And they are written there to give us an example of what the devil's devices are and his schemes and his tactics that they, he used, which he is still using the same tactics today, so that when we go through something, we can ask Holy Spirit to show us from the word of God what is actually happening and what is the key for breakthrough in that moment. That's why this part where it says put on the whole armor, grab hold of this, clothe yourself, find out what's in here. Because this is what helps you to be strong. 
This is what gives you the strategy. And it's not, you know, I'm having a financial problem, so let me go and find somebody who had a financial problem and then figure out what they did. Pray and ask Holy Spirit to show you in the word what is the key for your current situation. And then study that and meditate on it and allow God to reveal to you principles that you can grab hold of and use like weapons so that you can stand strong in the situation that you're in. These, I, I've always found this to be interesting. The things that they walked through, they weren't just for them then. They were written for us. Their lives were examples to us to show us the strategies that God has for us of how to overcome every kind of attack that the devil would ever bring against us. So read your Bible. Read it. Continue to read your Bible. It's very important to read our Bibles. Verse 12 says this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. People are not your enemy. We often make people our enemy. We often feel like people are our enemy. But God's word is what is truth. So whenever we have ideas and foundational tr uh, principles in our life, in our heart, in our mind, that do not line up with the word of God, then we need to take our mindsets and submit them to the word of God, and pick up what he has said and replace what the enemy has taught us. People are not our enemy. People are not our enemy. Like, for real. I know sometimes this is hard to live out, but people are not your enemy. I don't care that some person said something about you that does not make them your enemy. We do not fight. We do not wrestle. We are not warring against flesh and blood. Not only are people not our enemy, but our goal is not to change other people's behavior. The Lord said that one to me last night. I was like, dude, for real? Sometimes our prayers have the goal of making somebody else change. Do you know that's not really a scriptural prayer? Even when we pray for our leaders, what does the word actually tell us? The word actually, the, the word tells us to pray for our leaders. But the word, word doesn't tell us to pray that our leaders do what we want them to do. It says for us to bless them and to pray for them. And then in Psalms, it says the heart of the king is in the hands of the, of the church. Of the believers? Of those who want to control it? Of the Lord. And he directs it whichever way we want, however we asked him to do it, however he wants. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Our goal in our prayer and our warfare is not to make other people change. Our warfare is is to cause us to change. Our enemy is the devil and the demons under his command that operate in darkness, the rulers of darkness, evil spirits in spiritual realm. Our fight is not to use our hands against these things. That is not our battle. Our fight is to resist Hold on, i got to prove it. Verse 13. Therefore, take the whole armor of God. Actually, can you put it up in the New, uh, New Living Translation? I forgot to bring mine with me, and the phone is just too small. I don't want to put the glasses on. <laughs> put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Who are we resisting? What does the enemy do? 
Yes, he likes to steal. He likes to kill. He likes to destroy. He likes to deceive us. He likes to get us to sin. So if people aren't our enemy, and the devil is our enemy, and God gives us this armor so that we can resist the devil, our fight is for us. So that we do not give the devil a foothold in our lives by allowing him to cause us to sin against God, which is how he destroys our lives. Because he has no power to actually destroy our life. He has not been given any authority over us. We have actually been given authority over him. So he cannot directly destroy your life. But he can cause you through pressure, through deception like he did with Eve. He deceived Eve into reasoning and questioning what God had said. And when he did that, she sinned, and the sin brought death. So the tactics that we are not ignorant of, because they're written in the Word, this is why we got to read the Bible, this is what the enemy does. He doesn't actually directly assault us. He causes a temptation. He causes a situation that will make our flesh act out in ungodly ways that will cause us to sin. And then when we sin, we open up the door for the wrath of God to come on us. We open up the door for the curse to come on us, which is listed in in Deuteronomy 28. You know, the first 14 verses are the blessing, but then it gives you the curse, which we've gone through a lot. So the enemy isn't cursing us. He's tricking us to position ourselves under a curse. So our fight is not against people. Our fight isn't even against demons. So we're not warring after demons. And I mean, I've seen some people do some crazy things. I've seen people actually, like, literally put armor on and a sword and run around a place and pretend like they were cutting demons apart. We're not... The battle is God's. The battle's not ours. We sang the song this morning, right? (laughs) It was scriptural. The battle's not ours, but we are called to be prepared to stand. Our fight is to resist so that we can stand firm against the strategy the enemy has. He wants to destroy us by causing us to act in a way that takes us out from underneath the blessing and the protection of the Lord. Sin opens the door to destruction. It steals the blessing and the provision and the protection that God has already given to us that is belongs to us. So we resist. We stand firm. You know, I've heard people say this, and actually I heard, was it Pastor Jeff who said this, that if you get offended, that either one of two things has happened, that either you've been deceived, that you don't know deception, that uh, offense is a sin, or you're ignorant or no, rebellious. You either don't know that offense is a sin or you're being rebellious when you get offended. So we say, well, they offended me. What they did was offensive. Okay. What somebody did to you may be offensive, but the act of you becoming offended is your choice. So um, I had this kid this one time, and you know, if, if you're... Um, a little sensitive, don't ever ask a child to guess your age. <laughs> so there was this group of kids, and, you know, like, well, how old do they, they ask, how old are you? When they ask that, either tell them it's none of their business or just give them the answer. Do not ask them to guess unless you're strong. <laughs> I said, well, why don't you guess? So one kid a- said that I was three and the other one said I was 94. <laughs> one was a little closer than the other. <laughs> it obviously was a three-year-old. <laughs> now, I'm giving this example because it would be ridiculous for me to get offended by a child that guessed that I was 94 years old. 
but I could. It's my choice. Why do I not get offended by the kid who said, oh, you're 94? Because I understand that that's just a child, and they don't have a full understanding of what they're saying, and maybe they have not paid attention in school very well. Maybe they need glasses. I can, I can give them grace because I know they're just a child. But now what if this is somebody who's like the same age as me, and they say something offensive to me, and I decide that I'm not going to give them that grace, that I'm going to take an offense. That's my choice. So it doesn't matter what anybody does to me. It's my choice. So that's why it says here that we are able to resist, because when people come up and say something rude to us, yes, they may have said something rude, but it's our choice of whether we get offended. Because once we get offended, then we open up the door for hatred, for cruelty, for malice, for revenge, for jealousy, for anger. The Bible says to be angry and sin not. You can be angry at an injustice that has happened, but when you go to hating and seeking vengeance and uh, defending yourself, then you're actually stepping into sin, which was the whole reason why the devil sent that person to say that to you in the first place. Because he didn't want you to be able to stand against his attack. And he wanted to steal from your life. And too many of us are falling prey to too easy of tactics. So what they don't like your outfit? So what they think you're fat? So what they think you're stupid? Are they your God? Then what does it matter what they think? They are not your enemy. I want to read this scripture to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh or in the natural, we do not war in the way that the natural man wars. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our warfare is about what happens in here and in here. And we are not ignorant to the devil's devices, but we have been given armor to protect us. So what is this armor that God has given to us? Well, the first one, I mean, you, you can make references if you want to, and I, and I think a lot of times people do this, you know, what does a belt mean? What does a breastplate mean? And, and that's a valid study. But I don't want to look at that this morning. I want to look at this. What is the first weapon that we have? Truth. What is truth? You know I'm going to pull it up. <laughs> and who does this represent? Our first line of defense against the enemy is the truth of Jesus. John 8, 31 and 32 says, actually, let me just read it. It's good to hear the pages turn. I know that we can, you know, use our devices, but you should always have a, a paper Bible. And really the reason why, or part of the reason why is, I have noticed, you know, they do updates on different versions of the Bible, and things change. So sometimes you go to look at it one day, and then the next day you open up that same version on your device, and because they updated the version, those words have actually changed. So you should always have one of these. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said to those Jews that believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Our freedom from sin comes from the truth. What else did he list as our armor? Our righteousness. 
my right standing with God that has nothing to do with me, but has everything to do with Christ. The righteousness of Christ is my righteousness. So I don't have to fall prey to shame. I don't have to fall prey to condemnation. I don't have to fall prey to judgment. Because when I come by the blood of Jesus before the throne of God, I am already made righteous. What else? It says, it says the peace that is given by the gospel. And actually, when you, when, you, when you look at what this word is, you know, we use the word peace in so many different ways. But this, the word here actually means harmony. And what it's talking about is it reconciled us. The gospel, what Jesus did for us on the cross, reconciled us because at one time we were enemies with God. But because of the blood, because of what Jesus did, we have been reconciled to God. We have peace with God. We are no longer fighting. We are at a place of rest with him. What else? It says the shield of faith. Our faith is the assurance in what God has said to us. Our salvation, it says, the, the helmet of salvation. These are the things that God has given us that are spiritual weapons that fight against the tactics that the enemy brings to our mind and to our heart to trick us into sinning so that we destroy ourself. And then it says this in, in verse 17. And to take up the sword of the Spirit. That sword is the only one of those pieces of armor that's actually an offensive weapon. That's why on Tuesday nights, a lot of times I will have us starting to read the Word. Because the next part talks about praying. But if we're not praying according to the Word, then according to James, we're praying amiss and for our own evil desire. I mean, we don't like to acknowledge that, but sometimes we're praying that somebody else changes because we don't like what they're doing. That's really our own, and God, God's word, not mine, so if you want to get upset with someone, you can get upset with him, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it's an evil desire in us to want to change somebody else. The appropriate desire is for us to change and to leave them in God's hands because guess what? They belong to him. People are not our enemy. But it's the word of God that we use to combat these things that are coming against us. We stand firm in our salvation. We stand firm in our righteousness. We stand firm in the truth. We stand firm with faith. We stand firm in the peace that God has given us between him and, and us, that we know that we can boldly come before his throne, that we have access to him whenever we need it, that we have all of these things things that are given to us in the word, and then we take the word and we war with it. And how do we war with it? By praying always with all prayer. That means, do you know there are different types of prayer? There are different types of prayer. And we use the word of God to war with all those types of prayer. The armor is personal. You know, David couldn't put Saul's armor on because it didn't fit his person. That armor belonged to Saul. It did not belong to David. Armor is a very personal thing. And though we don't really use armor like they're talking about here, somebody had to fit it to your body. Otherwise it was, um, what's the word? Where it doesn't work right. Not a hindrance. You know what I mean. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's like dysfunctional. That's not the word. It'll come. It, I'll just blurt it out later. Ineffective. Thank you. If you have armor on that does not fit you, it will be ineffective for protecting you because either it's going to be too big and there will be spots where the enemy can get a weapon in or it's going to be too small, and there are going to be parts of you that are not covered. So the armor is actually ineffective if it's not yours personally. 
These things have been given to us personally. We have a personal relationship with God. We have a personal relationship with our Savior. So we pray at all times, standing in truth and righteousness and peace and faith and salvation. These are our foundation. We have them on us. We walk in them. And then we pick up the word of God, and through prayer, we war, but not with people. We war before the throne, reminding God of his promises. We come in like Pastor Bobby taught us. We come before the throne room. I don't need to deal with the devil. He's not my problem. I need to go and to deal with the Lord and to remind him of his word. Is it Ezekiel? And and the, the, the word says, God said, I sought for a man who would come, who would call out for mercy for the people. But there was no one, so I had to let the curse come on them. We war before the throne of God, saying back to him and coming into agreement with what he has spoken so that he can bring it down to where we are. Not only are we to pray, but we're to pray alert, to be watching. It says watching with all perseverance. I think in the New Living it says Staying alert. So let me give you a little hint. There are a lot of things going on in our world right now. Most of the things that are going in around us in the world right now are distractions that you don't even need to deal with because all they do is monopolize your time fighting with things that have nothing to do with what God has spoken. And we need to get into this word and protest before the throne of God for his righteousness to be established in our land. That we come before the throne of God and we take a look at anything that's in us that doesn't line up with the armor and repent for it, and turn away from those wicked practices, and humble ourselves before the Lord, and pray, and that says then then he will hear us, and he will heal our land. So don't be distracted. I heard that at prayer on Tuesday night. Do not be distracted by the things that are going on. It's not that you can't talk to the Lord about them, but do not allow them to distract you and monopolize your time because we're listening to what the enemy has spoken instead of what God has. What did God speak to you? Who did God call you to be? What has he declared and spoken over your life? What did he say to you during our prayer and fasting time in January? Have you even thought about it lately? Because that's what he declared for this year. And guess what? He knew coronavirus was coming, and he knew riots were coming, and he knew dust plumes were coming, and he knew locusts were coming, and he knew all these things were coming, and he knew what was going to happen in the economy, but still in January, he spoke things to us. So don't allow the issues of the world to distract you from what God has spoken, but get into the word and find where God has actually said that and start warring with it through prayer standing firm in what he has provided for us so that we don't fall into the trap of the enemy and bring ourselves into a place of destruction. Bring ourselves into a place where the blessing isn't on our lives and our families and our children and our finances and our home and our shoes and our car. What has the Holy Spirit said to our church family? Because not only has God spoken to you personally, but he's spoken to us collectively as a family together. He's declared things over us, and we need to walk in them. One of the things that God spoke to us at the beginning of the year was that prodigals were coming home. 
But if you have allowed the issues of the day to distract you from declaring God's word that prodigals are coming home, guess what? How is God going to do what he wants to do if we're not coming into agreement with him? God wants to do a lot of things, but he actually told us the way that we pray is to pray for his will to be done. That means his will is not being done unless we come into agreement and ask for him to have his will be done. So God spoke things to us that are his will for our lives, but we have to come into agreement with them. And we have to rid ourselves of anything that is a stronghold of the enemy that causes us to uh, have the enemy operating in our life in that area. Our church vision is to have a Holy Spirit-led church where sons and daughters are discipled where we grow in the Lord. Not even just individually, but together as a church family. That we grow together in the things of the Lord for the express reason of going out and fulfilling the work of the ministry. That is the vision of our church. I just put it into different words. And that is what we need to keep paramount before us, not the issues that are going on around us. Don't allow the enemy to distract you from what God has spoken over you. But stand firm in truth, in your righteousness, in the peace that God has given to you, in your salvation, standing with faith, and using the word of God in your prayer time. It is not a time to hold back from prayer. It is a time to push forward, and if you think the battle is over, it is not over yet. I know 2020 is a weird year, that there is no mistake about that. There's some weird stuff going on, and so when we see these kind of things happening, we need to become even more vigilant to stand with the word of God and declare before the throne of God, pray to intercede, and to not stop until we see his will being fulfilled, the things that he told us happening. I'm not stopping praying for your prodigals until I see them in the building. Or I hear your testimony, because they don't live around this area, that they gave their heart back to the Lord. Because God said prodigals are coming home. And I don't care what's going on in the world. My prayer is for the prodigals. Amen? So I want you to be encouraged. I want you to go and find those things that God has spoken to you. And let that be your vision and put away the temptation to be distracted by what the devil is doing because the battle is God's. We don't have to wage war in there. We just have to get into his face and declare his word and his promises and watch him fight for us because we've already been given victory. Amen? Amen. Lord, we praise you for your word. May your word grow and magnify, multiply. In the early church, it said, and the word of God grew and multiplied, and the church flourished. May God's word grow and multiply. Amen? Amen. May it grow and multiply in our hearts, and in our homes, and in our church, and in our area. Amen? Amen. This is our area. Say, this is our area. We will guard it. We will pray for it. We will stand for it. And we will see revival. And you can declare that this way. This is, this is my land. I declare revival over this land. You, you have your families. This is my family. I declare revival over my family. The enemy will not touch my family. Because I cover them with my faith. Praise the Lord. You have a song for us? Let's sing before we close. Holy, there There is is no no one one like you. you. There There is none none beside you. 
to the 